Hi guys, Matt Easton here. So um, a few months ago, I guess now, we had a bit of a discussion about the Indian sword known as a putter. And you know what? Here I have one. Um, so this came to me with a bunch of other antiques. Uh, as you know, I collect antiques and sell some. And um, yeah, this came to me and I didn't want to miss up the opportunity to get hold of one of these. Um, I First thing I should say about it is that it is pretty long and fairly hefty, okay? The blade is near enough 40 inches long, I think it's about 39 inches long. So it's a big broadsword blade. The blade is probably European, in fact I would say certainly European made, probably German. Uh, it is exactly the type of blade that you get on Highland basket hilt broadswords um, and other cavalry, big cavalry swords of the late 17th and through the 18th century. So it's probably an 18th century weapon or possibly the blade is older than the hilt. They were still making these in the 19th century, but they were really in the height of their vogue, I suppose, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and I believe the Marathas, uh, Maratha Empire, uh, were particularly famed for using them. Um, for those of you who have never seen one of these before, it is a usually a big broadsword blade. Sometimes you get rapier blades on them, but usually it's a big broadsword blade, mounted on a gauntlet-like hilt. The, you'll notice the gauntlet is not articulated at all. Okay, it's completely solid, and I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Um, the way that the two are attached, I'll just get my hand out of here. <coughs> the way that the two are attached is you can hopefully see that there's a kind of a tongue that comes down each side of the blade, what I would call a langette, much like on a pole weapon, and it has rivets through the blade, so they drill holes through the blade, and if you look on the inside, I don't know if you can see in this light because the sun is quite low, unfortunately. Don't know if you can see that, but essentially the blade is just cut off flush inside the hilt. The hilt itself is sheet steel, um, pretty much like a gauntlet, but it has no articulation whatsoever. It's a, a solid, kind of like almost like a turtle shell, and it's utterly shaped uh, for the hand. Obviously, the fist goes in there. This is very, very tight around the wrist. It allows no movement whatsoever. And this cuff flares out a little bit, obviously, because your forearm flares out. You'll notice also it has a raised ridge over here. This is quite characteristic. That presumably is so that the little bones, i just try and stick it under my arm, the little bones of your wrist here don't um, impact too painfully against the inside of the gauntlet. Now, the gauntlets, um, uh, originally were usually padded inside. In my case it's lucky that this one isn't padded because I wouldn't fit my hand in. It is incredibly tight fit and lots of my friends who've tried to put their hands in this didn't manage. I've got, I haven't got small hands but I've got fairly narrow hands uh, and so I can kind of weasel my hand in there. Uh, if someone with fat uh, fists can't get their hand in there at all. And this isn't even particularly small. Lots of them are even smaller than this. Um, so that much like many Indian weapons, they're designed to really jam your hand in and be a really, really tight fit. Um, in terms of how you actually hold the thing, well, I'll show you how I get my hand in. So you'll notice that it's very small around the wrist here, so I would never, ever be able to fit my fist through that bit. So you don't just insert your hand in. There's a trick to it. It has a raised bar here, okay? You stick your hand through there, and then you have to... There we go. You have to kind of lift your wrist into place there and then weasel your fingers in and once it's in there it's absolutely tight and that bar that you'll notice I'm holding much like a buckler handle has is riveted either side okay so it's a bit like holding a sort of shield but with a great big sword blade sticking out of it. Now um, there have been a few things said about these that I now think are if not wrong, they're inaccurate, at least in the case of this example. One thing that I've said, uh, I've seen said uh, in various places online, is that these are flexible bladed, almost whip bladed swords. That is not whip bladed. That is a massive, great German broadsword blade. Okay, that is not whipping anywhere. That is no more flexible than one of my sabers. Okay, it's an utterly stiff blade, and in fact some of these have rapier blades on, as I mentioned, Spanish and Italian rapier blades. So I don't believe that these were ever originally, in the 18th and, well, 17th to 19th century, ever really intended to be whip-bladed swords. And I have seen demonstrations of uh, in modern Indian martial arts that are of, I I'll be blunt about it, are of dubious 
historical accuracy. I think, uh, I think unfortunately, certain Indian martial arts uh, have made a lot of stuff up in recent years, as unfortunately has some Chinese martial arts, as far as weapons are concerned, because they want to include weapons displays and, you know, they want to learn how to use these weapons. And unfortunately, I've seen some, I believe it was Kalari Piatu uh, demonstrations with putters, where they were incredibly whip-bladed and they were whipping them around like, like a whip, like a great big kind of like lasso almost. I have never ever seen, I've, I've handled quite a lot of these putters, I've never owned one before but I've handled quite a few, and I have never ever seen an original one which had a blade which would even remotely be similar to that whippy type of blade you see in certain modern Indian martial arts displays. So I kind of call bullshito on that, I don't think it's real, I think that's bull, okay? Uh, they are big European broadsword blades, or in some cases as I mentioned rapier blades. Now the next thing is, I would have thought that this is probably a thrusting weapon, okay? Because obviously the katar or punch dagger is predominantly a thrusting weapon. Um, <coughs> and I would have thought, because of the arrangement for this, that maybe it was a cavalry weapon. I've now completely revised that opinion because if you ran someone through on a horse with this, you would never get it out again. There is a certain technique and trick to extracting swords and lances when run through someone on horseback and it really requires wrist mobility. You can't do it with a fixed wrist. You'd literally get taken off the back of your horse or your shoulder dislocated or your arm broken. Okay, so I do not believe that these were ever uh, sensibly used, I don't think they were ever intended to be used to run through someone on horseback because I think that would be suicide, okay, or at least very, very, very painful. Um, now, what is interesting is we have, so far, I've only found one European, uh, i.e. British, uh, descriptive account of these being used. And it was at a display in the early 1800s, I believe it was about 1820, um, and it describes at a festival, someone brought one of these swords out and it calls it a pata and says, you know, describes, it calls it a gauntlet sword and, and, and describes what's very clearly this weapon. And it says that the person doing the display put a number of uh, fruit on the ground, actually on the ground, um, I believe they were limes or lemons, I can't remember which, um, and then did a load of circular kind of uh, impressive twirly movements, maybe a bit of jumping, I can't remember if they mentioned, but a lot of kind of dancey, impressive swirly movements, which of course we know is done in Gutka, modern, you know, the still surviving um, uh, Indian uh, swordsmanship art. And um, after doing a load of sort of uh, impressive movements, the person then sliced these um, fruits that were on the ground without touching the ground and sliced them clean through. So, clearly this was used for cutting and had a system of movement that went with it that sounds somewhat like other Indian swordsmanship. In other words, it sounds like Gatka, which is often described in 19th century European sources as looking like a dance. Uh, literally, they often describe it as the Indian dance. Um, uh, and a person before they go into combat doing this dancing movement and moving around with the sword or the sword and the buckler or pair of swords, whatever they're using, even sometimes with spears, before they go into combat to get into this system of movement. And it's very clear that this was something that was absolutely known about in the 18th and 19th centuries because the British sources are like, oh yeah, the guy started moving the, uh, moving the sword around just like you know all Indian uh, warriors do with their swords. They just started moving around like this and started cutting things. And this is what's described with this weapon. So it's a very interesting thing. I think how these were actually used, I don't know how clear it is, but it is worth noting, of course, that the wrist is completely immobilised. And in that sense, it's quite similar to a tulwar, because if you think about what I've said about a tulwar with the disc pommel, that kind of immobilises the wrist as well, but in a different plane. In that plane, the blade is at 90 degrees to what this one is. But there's still, it seems like it's almost an Indian thing to Indian weapons, that they want to limit the motion of the wrist to increase the use of the elbow and the shoulder of getting power and putting the whole body into the movement of the weapon. Um, and also it seems that, that Indian swordsmanship predominantly relied on the cut, that they weren't big fans of using the point. 
So there we go. I'm sure I'll have more to say about this weapon at some point, but at the moment it's it's producing some quite interesting, just moving it around is producing some quite interesting kind of thoughts and results about how these things might have been used. And the last thing I should mention as well is that these are usually shown in artwork from the 18th century where the Marathas are shown uh, holding these alongside tulwars and kandars and other types of Indian sword. These are shown mixed in with those. These are usually shown with a shield or a buckler in the other hand. So the whole time that you were doing this sort of motion with the sword maybe and using it for these big uh, powerful body cuts there would have been a shield or a buckler to protect you uh, in front of your body. So an interesting weapon anyway and I will say ah, slightly painful. <laughs> Cheers guys I'm sure I'll have some more to say about this in the future. Bye.